Kia ora and welcome to episode 3 of our deep dive into the spells in Pathfinder 2nd edition and D&D 5th edition. Where we compare all the spells with the same name and just see what is different between them, which spell and which system I prefer, and generally grade each spell. The spells we are looking at today will be Chain Lightning, Charm, Chill Touch, Clairvoyance, Cloud Kill, Colour Spray, Command, Comprehend Languages and Cone of Cold. But first I'd like to pass it over to Abigail who is running a really amazing Kickstarter I think you guys will enjoy. It is coming. It has returned. The second Kickstarter. Welcome to Modular Realms, home of magnetic flat pack double sided terrain. With these terrain pieces, you can build up dungeons on the fly as your players are discovering them. With the magnetic terrain, I can easily remove walls. Ye gods, put it back, put it back! Put them back. If a player triggers a trap, Oh no. I can quickly change the terrain out for something else. Seriously? This Kickstarter has pledges of both our classic terrain and also there are lots of other add-ons to choose from. With the Wall Dungeon Lord, you can build complex dungeon networks on the go or rearrange them to make something completely different. With our new patent pending magnetic design, each piece is able to connect to every other piece, regardless of orientation. This is because we have magnets that spin within the sockets. It is so satisfying. All the terrain was designed by me to be everything that I want and need as a dungeon master. What are you doing here? Bring your games to life with Modular Realms. Now we can have a look at different comments people made from episode 2 of our series. David Rise mentioned, The mention of angelic bloodlines on Blade Barrier reminds me of an important note. Sorcerers aren't strictly arcane casters. Angelic, demonic, diabolic and undead bloodlines are divine spellcasters. What angelic getting it means is they automatically add it to their repertoire without spending a spell known for it. To add, Draconic and Imperial bloodlines are Arcane, Aberrant and Hag are Occult, and Fey and Elemental are Primal. And then he made an edit a bit later, I should probably clarify that I'm talking about Pathfinder Sorcerers. So that is correct, we can have a look at the different magic traditions here. It says here, Spellcasters cast spell from one of four different spell lists, each representing different magical traditions, Arcane, Divine, Occult and Primal. Now without going into a huge amount of detail on every individual tradition, we can see here your primary arcane spellcaster is obviously going to be the wizard, but the sorcerers, they have different bloodlines that can access this spell tradition. With that you've got your draconic and imperial from your core rulebook, and the genie from the APG. Also if you are a rune witch, which comes from the APG, you also have access to the arcane tradition. Divine is primarily clerics and oracles, with the angelic, demonic, diabolic, undead, psychopomp and worm blessed sorcerers all having access to it. The worm bless is basically like your draconic sorcerer, but for the imperial worms found in the Lost Omens Magwai Expanse book. And your fever witch also has access to divine magic. Your occultic spellcasters will be primarily your bard, however the aberrant, hag and shadow sorcerers also have access to this, with the curse, fate and night witches also being occultic spellcasters. And your primary primal spellcaster is your druid, however elemental, fey and your nymph sorcerers from the AGP and the witches have access to it if they have a wild, winter and Baba Yaga as their patron, Baba Yaga coming from the Lost Omen legend book. Now how did Paizo come up with which class has access to what and which particular spells go into which tradition? Well, little segue here, it comes from the four essences. This is found in your core rulebook and 
I get the feeling it's going to be expanded on a little bit more in Secrets of Magic, which will be coming out end of this week. Possibly out for a lot of people already. I haven't got my copy yet, but yep, you've got your four essences. Matter, also called body, material, essence, or physical essence. Matter is the fundamental building block that makes up all physical things in the universe. So with that, the arcane and primal traditions are especially attuned towards it, as well as the spells that often focus on conjuration, evocation, and transmutation. Spirit, called the soul, the ethereal essence, or spiritual essence. Spirit is the outerworldly building block that makes up beings of material and immortal self. The spirit travels through the ethereal plane into the great beyond after the death of the physical body. The spirit is the most easily attuned to divine and occultic spells. Spirit spells are usually divination or necromancy. Mind, also called thought, mental or astral essence, mind is what allows thinking creatures to have rational thoughts, ideas, plans, logic and memories. Mind touches even non-sapient creatures like animals though in a more limited capacity. Arcane and occult casters usually excel at mind spells. Mind spells usually use the essences that are found in divination, enchantment and illusion schools. And the last essence is called life, also called hearth, faith, instinct or vital essence. Life represents the animating universal force within all things. Whereas matter provides the base of the material body, life keeps it alive and well. This essence is responsible for the unconscious, written responsible for belief, such as ancestral instincts and divine guidance. The divine and primal traditions hold power over life. Life spells are usually necromantic. Okay, so having a look at the four essences, what does this mean? Well, when the AGP came out, I actually saw a fair few YouTubers get a little confused about this. Now, the prime reason for this was the superstition instinct for the Barbarian. It says here, choose two associated magical traditions, arcane and occult, arcane and primal, divine and occult, or divine and primal. The resistance from your age and resistance class feature applies against all damage you take from the spells cast with the two traditions of magic. Why does it say that? Well, if we have a look, arcane and occult. What is that? If we go back to our list here, that is primarily mind magic. So you're protecting your mind. If you're doing arcane and primal, well, that is matter or the essence of matter. You can have your divine and occult. Well, that is spirit magic. And you can have divine and primal being life magic. So that is basically how you can kind of tell which particular spells will belong to which tradition and why certain classes have access to it. A druid usually has access over life-given forces as well as the physical building blocks of the universe. So that is life and matter. You'll find a lot of occultic practitioners like the aberrant sorcerer or the curse witch often have a lot to do with spirit magic or the mind magic. So dealing with the spiritual forces behind magic or dealing with the people's mind. Now, if we put that into D&D, D&D kind of doesn't have the traditions, but you can pretty much see what particular spells go with what. So arcane is generally artificer, sorcerer, warlock and wizard magic. Divine will be your cleric, your divine soul sorcerers and your paladin. Occultic magic is usually bards and your primal magic is your druid and your ranger. So when we judge a spell from a tradition, we're going to be using the Pathfinder tradition and say it comes from the occultic tradition. Well, Pathfinder, that'll be bard, sorcerers and witches. In D&D, that is bards. That is pretty much how we're judging it and that's just a brief introduction into the actual metaphysics of magic and the behind the scenes work that Paizo are trying to put through. So thank you for that David Rise, we, yep, you are correct in what you said and that there is an in-depth explanation. This obviously will be changing with the secrets of magic, but we'll get into that probably in episode 4. Okay, the local disaster tour guide, woohoo, part 2 of the series. As last time, greatly enjoyed it, thank you for that, I enjoy making these. 
I do have one question. It relates to access. Basically, are you counting the Advanced Players Guide classes for 2E when it comes to access? Sometimes it seems you are, such as when you mention the Psychopomp bloodline for sorcerers. Other times it seems like you aren't. As an example, you say Divine Access as Clerics. It seems to only apply for clerics, although oracles also have access to divine magic. So, long story short, are you counting the witches and oracles for the access portion? Okay, yes I am. What I am doing is, I basically work off the books I have. Now I don't have access to Secrets of Magic, obviously, but I'm basically accepting everything from the core rulebook, the APG and the Game Master's Guide, as well as all three beast trees. And as for the Lost Omen settings, I'm working off the World Guide, Gods and Magic, Character Guide, Ancestral Guide, Legends, Pathfinder Society Guide, Magwai Expanse, and I do let stuff through from the Fall of Plaguestone, mainly because that was the first book I bought as an expansion for this before I got any Lost Omen stuff. Um, my brother loves having it because it actually has access to a really nice crossbow he likes. However, I'm not using any of the core adventure paths, so I don't have access to the Shuni, as well as any spells within that. Primarily, as we are dealing with spells, the Gods and Magic book will be the primary book we are using. I believe two or three spells come from the Gods and Magic book. And when we get into the different cleric domains in a later series, I'll be using Gods and Magic. There isn't really too much. I mean, the Character's Guide and Ancestral Guide don't have access to any spells. The World Guide, I believe, only has Snowball. Uh, Legends has a few spells added to it, and Pathfinder Society Guide mainly has focuses for, I believe it is one of the Pathfinder subclasses, but thinking about that, that could be from the Legends as well, or the Character Guide. And Magwai Expanse, I don't remember seeing any particular spells in there, but I did see a new Sorcerer class being the Imperial Dragons. Razley Ford said really like the comparison between damage and hit points. It's now more clear that Pathfinder Acid Arrow deals more damage. Thank you for that, although I would like to point out that I am counting it only as you get one lot of persistent acid damage. Um, from now on that's all I'm going to count it as. I know there is a 1 in 4 chance of you ignoring the persistent damage and there is a high possibility of it going on longer, but just for the sake of comparison from now on I will only ever be counting persistent damage as one round of extra damage. That sort of ties it in with the D&D spells a bit more. And Tim Cashmore put down, do you think the effects of spells like Bless and Bane and D&D should be rated higher as they have two effects instead of the Pathfinder ones? Yeah, I think you are right. There were a few spells I've looked at that I've rated as a drawer. However, one particular side had much better effects. So from now on, I'm instituting a new ranking. If a spell has a much, much better effect, i.e. it does two things instead of one, or it's just objectionally a better spell, I'm going to be giving it a bonus point which will count to its overall markings. And that is all the comments, so thank you to everyone who commented, I do read them all, I try and respond, and I'll be putting all your comments into here. So now we can look at our first spell, Chain Lightning. For D&D, this is a 6th level spell, its casting time is 1 action, its range and area is 150 feet, it requires vocal, material and somatic components, it is available for the sorcerer and wizard, and it has a deck save to avoid the damage. You create a bolt of lightning that arcs towards a target of your choice that you can see within range. Three bolts then leap from that target to as many as three other targets, each of whom must be within 30 feet of the first target. A target can be a creature or an object and can be targeted only once by the bolts. A target must make a deck saving throw. The target takes 10d8 lightning damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. And at higher levels, when you cast this of a spell slot of 7th level or higher, add one additional bolt. Pathfinder, it is also a level 6 spell. Its traditions are arcane and primal. 
To cast it, it requires two actions and it is somatic and verbal. Its range is 500 feet and it targets one creature plus any number of additional creatures. So you discharge a powerful bolt of lightning at the target dealing 8d12 electrical damage. The target must attempt a basic reflex save. The electricity arcs to another creature within 30 feet of the first target, jumps to another creature within 30 feet of that target and so on. You can end the chain at any point. You can't target the same creature more than once and you must have a line of effect to all targets. Roll the damage only once. It applies to each target, halving or double as approximate for its save and throw outcome. The chain ends if any one of the targets critically succeeds its save. And the heightened effect is the damage increases by 1d12. So we can have a look at the rankings. Both have access to it at level 6, so this is going to be a draw. For the access, it is only sorcerers and wizards have an access to it in D&D, whereas in Pathfinder it is your arcane and primal spell practitioners, so this is going to be a win for Pathfinder. Range and target, it is 150 feet and it targets one creature and then bounces off to three creatures for D&D. For Pathfinder it is 500 feet and it will target one creature and then any number of creatures as long as they are within a line or within a chain and they don't make a saving throw, or a critical saving throw I should say. So that'll be once again a win for Pathfinder. Casting time is one action versus two actions, this is a draw. Casting components, vocal, somatic and material for D&D, just vocal and somatic for Pathfinder, this will be a win for Pathfinder. The effect, it is 10d8 for D&D, this does between 10 to 80 damage in one hit and it's about 45 for the average. In Pathfinder it is 8d12, this will do a minimum of 8 but a maximum of 96 damage and 52 for the average damage, this is going to be a win for Pathfinder. Both have an instantaneous duration, this will be a draw. And Chain Lightning for D&D, it is heightened to one additional bolt per spell level. So basically every spell level you can target an individual person. Whereas Pathfinder, it does 1d12 extra damage per spell level. So at maximum level, which is level 10, this is doing a grand total of 12 to 44 damage with an average damage of 78 on every target it hits. And remember it can hit an unlimited target, the only stopping is if you stop it or if somebody makes a critical saving throw. Calling this one definitely a win for Pathfinder. And for the save, D&D is it is a deck save, whereas Pathfinder is a reflex which is based on your dexterity anyway. I'm going to call this one a draw. So for the first time I believe in the entire series we have someone who's gotten all 9 points, that will be Pathfinder. This is clearly a win for Pathfinder. Now we can look at the spell Charm. For D&D this is split into two different spells, Charm Person and Charm Monster. So for D&D, Charm Person is a first level spell. Its cast in time is one action and it's available for bards, druids, sorcerers, warlocks, wizards and the trickery domain clerics get access to this for free. Its range is 30 feet and it requires vocal and somatic components. Its duration is one hour, this isn't a concentrated duration, and it has a wisdom save. You attempt to charm a humanoid you can see within range. It must make a wisdom save and throw and it does so with advantage if you and your companions are fighting it. If it fails the save and throw it is charmed by you until the spell ends or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. The charmed creature regards you as a friendly acquaintance. When the spell ends the creature knows it was charmed by you and at higher levels when you cast the spell of a spell slot second level or higher you can target one additional creature for each slot above first. The creatures must all be within 30 feet of each other when you target them. Now we can look at Charm Monster for D&D which is a 4th level spell available for bards, druids, sorcerers, warlocks and wizards. Its cast in time is 1 action, it has a range of 30 feet, it requires vocal and somatic components and its duration is 1 hour with wisdom save. You attempt to charm a creature you can see within range. It must make a wisdom save and throw and does so with advantage if you or your companions are fighting it. If it fails its saving throw it is charmed by you until the spell ends or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. 
A charmed creature is friendly to you. When the spell ends, the creature knows it was charmed by you. And at higher levels, when you cast the spell using a slot of 5th level or higher, you can target one additional creature for each slot above 4th level. The creatures must all be within 30 feet of each other when you target them. For Pathfinder, this is a level 1 spell simply called Charm. Its traditions are arcane, occult and primal, however the diabolic, fey and nymph bloodlines all have access to this, and the clerics get access to this if they are followers of Arbard Lily, Asimodius, Belial, Calistria, Hathor, Nalanavata, Ravathra, Strovothanan, and the Green Mother, Anzuria. That is quite a mouthful. Its casting time is two actions and it requires somatic and verbal components. It has a range of 30 feet, it targets one creature, the saving throw is will, and its duration is one hour. To the target, your words are honey and your visage seems bathed in a dreamy haze. It must attempt a will save with a plus four circumstance bonus if you or your allies recently threatened or used hostile actions against it. You can dismiss the spell. If you use hostile actions against the target, the spell ends. When the spell ends, the target doesn't necessarily realise it was charmed unless its friendship with you or the actions you convinced it to take clash with its expectations, meaning you could potentially convince the target to continue being friends via mundane means. And when the creature makes its will save, on a critical success, the target is unaffected and aware you tried to charm it. On a success, the target is unaffected but thinks your spell was something harmless instead of charm, unless it identifies the spell. On a failure, the target's attitude towards you becomes friendly. If it was friendly, it becomes helpful and it can't take hostile actions against you. And on a critical fail, the target's attitude becomes helpful towards you and it can't use any hostile actions towards you. And heightening the spell to 4th level, the duration lasts until the next time you make your daily preparation. Heightening the spell to 8th level, the duration lasts until the next time you make your daily preparation and you can target up to 10 individual creatures with one spell. So when we rank the spell, Charm Person is a first level spell for D&D, but Charm Monster is a fourth level spell, whereas Pathfinder, it is simply a first level spell to target anyone. This will be a win for Pathfinder. The access, Bards, Druids, Sorcerers, Warlocks and Wizards have access to it for D&D, whereas Arcane, Occult and Primal Practitioners have access to it for Pathfinder. The key factor here is the subclasses that have access to it. For D&D it is your Trickery Domain Cleric, whereas for Pathfinder you have access to it for the Diabolic, Fey and Nymph Bloodlines. Diabolic being a Divine Spellcaster, whereas Fey and Nymph Bloodlines are your Primal Spellcasters doesn't really add more to it, however the large list of different deities that have access to it will give this a slight edge for Pathfinder. So I'm going to give this one a win for Pathfinder. The range and target. For D&D it is 30 feet and one humanoid or one monster. Whereas for Pathfinder it is 30 feet and one creature. I'm actually going to be giving this a win to Pathfinder because it can just target one creature. Whereas D&D you have to have two different spells, one for humanoids, one for monsters. Casting time, one action versus two actions, this will be a draw. Casting component, both a vocal and somatic, this will be a draw. The effect will be charm target, this is a draw. The duration, both are one hour, neither require concentration. Once again, a drawer. The heightened, for D&D, each spell slot targets one additional creature or person, whereas Pathfinder, at level 4 it lasts longer and level 8 it targets more creatures. I am going to give this one a win for D&D, simply because being able to level up slowly, I just think it feels better for character progression. And the save for it, it is Wisdom for d and it is Willpower which is based off Wisdom for Pathfinder. I'm also going to call this one a drawer. 
So we can see this is yet another win for Pathfinder. It is a better spell, you're not wasting two particular spell slots just to have the same spell. Having one spell that does more is better than having two or three spells having to do the same effect. So clearly a win for Pathfinder. The next spell we are going to rank is Chill Touch. For D&D, this is a cantrip, available for sorcerers, warlocks and wizards, making it more an arcane spell. Its casting time is one action, it has a range of 120 feet, it requires vocal and somatic components, its duration is one round, and it is a ranged attack. So, you create a ghostly skeletal hand in the space of a creature within range. Make a ranged spell attack against the creature to assault it with the chill of the grave. On a hit, the target takes 1d8 necrotic damage, and it can't regain hit points until the start of your next turn. Until then, the hand clings to the target. If you hit an undead target, it also has disadvantage on attack rolls against you until the end of your next turn. And then this spell's damage increases by 1d8 when you reach 5th level, 11th level and 17th level. For Pathfinder, Chill Touch is also a cantrip. It is available to the Arcane, Divine and Occultic traditions. Its cast in time is 2 actions requiring somatic and verbal components. The range is Touch, targeting one living or undead creature and the saving throw is Fortitude. Siphoning negative energies into yourself, your hand radiates in pale darkness. Your touch weakens the living and disorients the dead, possibly even causing them to flee. The effect depends on whether the target is living or dead. So if you target a living creature, the spell deals negative damage equal to 1d4 plus your spellcasting modifier. The target attempts a basic fortitude save, but it is also enfeebled 1 for 1 round on a critical failure. And if you target an undead creature, the target is flat-footed for one round on a failed fortitude save. On a critical fail, the target is also fleeing for one round unless it succeeds a will save. And heightening every level this is heightened, its negative damage to living creatures is increased by 1d4. Now to rank Chill Touch, both systems have access to this as a cantrip, so this will be a drawer. For the access, sorcerers, warlocks and wizards have access to this for D&D, whereas arcane, divine and occult practitioners have this for Pathfinder. Clearly an easy win for Pathfinder. For the range and target, D&D has one target but at 120 feet, whereas Pathfinder has one target but it is only touch. This will be a win for D&D. Its cast in time is one action versus two actions, and the components are vocal and somatic for both systems, so this is a draw for both. Now the effects. For D&D it is 1d8 damage, as well as the target not being able to regain health, and undead have a disadvantage. Pathfinder also separates the effects into living and undead, but the living takes 1d4 plus spell casting, whereas the undead, the target is simply flat footed, and if they fail a will save, then they are fleeing. I am going to call this a direct win for DD, and I'm actually going to use the very first bonus point simply because, yes, it splits it into two, but it actually damages the undead, whereas Pathfinder. If the target is undead, then it doesn't actually take any damage. So this is the first use of the bonus, and this is a win easily for D&D with the extra bonus point. Duration. For D&D, it is the end of your next turn, whereas Pathfinder, it is one automatic round, and then it depends on the save. It could go on a bit longer. I'm calling this a win for D&D. The heightened edition, it is simply 1d8 damage at 5th, 11th and 17th, meaning once you're maximum level it will only ever be doing 4 to 32 damage with 18 being the average, whereas Pathfinder it is 1d4 when it hits a living creature, but this is every level. At maximum level, you can be doing 16 to 46 damage, and an average of 31 damage. So I'm going to call this a win for Pathfinder. 
and the save it is a spell attack roll so you have to beat their armor class for D&D whereas Pathfinder it's also a spell attack roll but once you make the attack they then have to make either a fortitude or a willpower to have much more damage or more effects stacked on top of it. I'm going to call this one a win for Pathfinder. And as we can see, Chill Touch has 6 points for Pathfinder, 6 points for D&D, however, because D&D gets that one extra bonus point, that ups it up to 7 points, meaning this is a win for D&D. Chill Touch is a better spell in D&D for the simple fact that it can target and do damage to both living and undead, whereas Pathfinder, it will only do damage to living and undead it can make flee. So that is a win for D&D. Now we can have a look at the spell Clairvoyance. For D&D this is a third level spell available to bards, clerics, sorcerers, wizards and the great old one warlock. The casting time is 10 minutes. The range is 1 mile. It requires vocal, somatic and material components. And that material component is a focus worth at least 100 gold points. Its duration is concentration for 10 minutes and there is no save. You create an invisible sensor within range in the location familiar to you, a place that you have visited or seen before, or in an obvious location that is unfamiliar to you, such as behind a door, around a corner, or in a grove of trees. The sensor remains in place for the duration and it can't be attacked or otherwise interacted with. When you cast the spell, you choose seeing or hearing. You can use the chosen sense through the sensor as if you're in its space. As your action, you can switch between seeing and hearing. A creature that can see the sensor, such as a creature benefited from sea invisibility or true sight, sees a luminous, intelligible orb about the size of your fist. For Pathfinder, this is split into two separate spells, Clara Audience and Clara Voyance. So Clara Audience is a third level spell, available for the arcane and occult practitioners. Its casting time is one minute, requiring somatic, material and verbal components. Its range is 500 feet, and its duration is 10 minutes without concentration. You create an invisible floating ear at the location within range, even if it's outside your normal line of sight or line of effect. It can't move, but you can hear through the air using your normal auditorial senses. And Clairvoyance is a level 4 spell available to arcane and occult practitioners. Its casting time is 1 minute, material, somatic and verbal components require it, and its range is 500 feet with a duration of 10 minutes. You create an invisible floating eye at the location within range, even if it's outside your normal line of sight. The eye can't move, but you can see in all directions from that point as if using your normal visual sensor. And this is also available to two separate deities. Now ranking these spells, this is a third level spell for D&D, whereas Pathfinder this is split off into a third level spell for auditorial effects and a fourth level spell for visual effects. This will be easily a win for D&D. The access, bards, clerics, sorcerers and wizards all have access to this, so that is your arcane, your divine and occult, and the great old one warlock also has access to this for D&D. Pathfinder, it is simply locked to arcane and occult, with two separate deities given access to this, I'm going to call this a win for D&D. The range and target, it creates a small orb in D&D that has a range of 1 mile, whereas Pathfinder it creates either a small ear or a small eyeball and its range is down to 500 feet. This is a win for D&D. Casting time, it takes 10 minutes in D&D to cast it, whereas it only takes 1 minute in Pathfinder to cast it. This is a win for Pathfinder. The casting components, it is vocal, somatic and material in D&D, however it requires 100 gold points worth of material components, whereas in Pathfinder it is simply vocal, somatic and material with no cost. This will be a win for Pathfinder. The effect, the one spell in D&D will create a sensory that you can hear or see from and you can swap between them at will. Whereas Pathfinder, it can create an eye that can see, or an ear that can hear in all directions, however it requires two separate spells for it, easy win for D&D. 
duration, both are 10 minutes, however Pathfinder, it doesn't require concentration, D&D you do have to concentrate on it, a win for Pathfinder, and there is no heightened version or any saves for this particular spell, so this is going to be a draw for both of them. Now counting them all up, D&D has a better effect as it is one effect for Pathfinder's two separate spells, as well as more people have an access to it and at a higher level, and the range is literally double, actually I think it's more than double, 500 feet is way more than one mile, I think it's 1600 feet, it's like 1600 meters for a mile, so easily a win for D&D. In this case it is simply a better spell and it's better to have one spell rather than two taking up slots in your spell slots. It's just a better spell for D&D. So this will be a second win for D&D. Now we can have a look at the spell Cloud Kill. This is a fifth level spell available to sorcerers and wizards. The Circle of the Land Druid and the Circle of the Spore Druids also have access to this, as well as the Alchemist, the Undead Warlock, the Death Domain Cleric, and the Oath of Conquest Paladin. Its cast in time is one action, requiring vocal and somatic components. The range is 120 feet with a 20 foot burst. Its duration is 10 minutes, requiring concentration, and it is a constitution save. You create a 20 foot radius sphere of poisonous yellow green fog centered at the point you choose within range. The fog spreads around corners and it lasts for the duration or until a strong wind disperses the fog, ending the spell. Its area is heavily obscured. When a creature enters the spell's area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, that creature must make a constitution saving throw. The creature takes 5d8 poison damage on a failed save and throw, or half as much damage on a successful one. Creatures are affected even if they hold their breath or don't need to breathe. The fog moves 10 feet away from you at the start of each of your turns, rolling along the surface of the ground. The vapours, being heavier than the air, sink to the lowest level of the land, even pouring down openings. And at high levels, you can cast the spell using a spell slot of 6th level or higher. The damage is increased by 1d8 for each slot above 5th. And for Pathfinder, Cloud Kill is a 5th level spell available to Arcane and Primal practitioners. However, the Undead Bloodline has access to this, and 3 different deities also give access to this spell. It requires 3 actions to cast, and it requires material, somatic, and verbal components. It has a range of 120 feet with a 20 foot area burst and its save and throw is a basic fortitude save and throw with the duration lasting one minute. You conjure a poisonous fog. This functions as obscuring mist except the area moves 10 feet away from you each round. You deal 68 poison damage to each breathing creature that starts its turn in the spell's area and you can dismiss the spell. And at heightened levels, every level above level 5 increases the damage by 1d8. Now we can rank these. Both spells are available at level 5 to both systems, so this will be a drawer. For access, alchemists, sorcerers, and wizards with the Circle of the Land, Under Dark, the Spores, the Death Domain, and the Conquest and Undead Warlock all have access to this for D&D. It's quite an expansive list, whereas it is an arcane and primal list for Pathfinder. I'm going to call this one a draw as well. For the range and target, both systems have 120 foot with a 20 foot burst. This will be a draw. Casting time, it is one action for D&D, whereas it is three actions for Pathfinder, this will be a win for D&D. Casting component, it is simply a vocal and somatic for D&D, whereas it requires vocal, somatic and material for Pathfinder, this is another win for D&D. The effect, both actually have kind of the same effect and an added effect odd to it. So for D&D it is 5d8 poison damage, giving you a range of between 5 and 40, with 22.5 being the average. However, it affects every creature within its range, whether they breathe or not. The effect for Pathfinder, it creates a mist which gives everybody in the area concealment and it does 68 poison damage which is a range between 6 and 48. This is an average of 27, so 
I'm sort of in two minds, but I'm actually going to give this one a draw for both. I like the fact that D&D you can affect all creatures, whereas Pathfinder it has more damage to breathing creatures and it creates a mist that conceals everybody. So I'm going to call this one a draw. The duration, it is 10 minutes concentration for D&D, and it's just one minute for Pathfinder. I'm going to call this one a win for Pathfinder. If it is for D&D, yes it lasts longer, but it requires concentration, meaning you can't cast any other spell that requires concentration. So this is a win for Pathfinder. The damage, it is 1d8 damage per spell level for D&D, giving you at maximum level 9 to 72 damage with an average of 40.5. For Pathfinder, it is also 1d8 damage per spell level. At maximum levels, this is going to give you 11 to 88 damage with an average of 49.5. So I'm going to call this one a win for Pathfinder. The saves, it is a constitution save and throw for D&D and a fortitude save and throw for Pathfinder. This is pretty much the same thing, so I am going to call this one a drawer. So with seven apiece, this spell is actually pretty much the same in both systems. There's a few slight effects, but I'm going to call this one a win for both systems. This is our first draw of today. Now we can look at the spell, Color Spray. For D&D, Colour Spray is a first level spell available for sorcerers and wizards. Its cast in time is one action and it requires vocal, somatic and material components. This spell is a 15 foot cone targeting from yourself. The duration is one round and it doesn't require any attack or save. A dazzling array of flashing coloured lights spreads from your hands. Roll 6d10. The total is how many hit points of creatures this spell can affect. Creatures in a 15 foot cone originating from you are affected in ascending order of their current hit points, ignoring unconscious creatures and creatures that can't see. Starting with the creature that has the lowest current hit points, each creature affected by the spell is blinded until the end of your next turn. Subtract each creature's hit points from the total before moving on to the creature with the next lowest hit points. A creature's hit points must equal or be less than the remaining total for that creature to be affected. And at high levels, when you cast the spell using a spell slot of second level or higher, roll an additional 2d10 for each slot above the first. For Pathfinder, Colour Spray is a first level spell available to arcane and occult practitioners, however the deities of Pulura and Shailen also give access to their clerics. Its casting time is two actions with somatic and verbal components, and it is a 15 foot cone starting from yourself. The saving throw is a willpower saving throw, and the duration is one or more rounds based on the saving throw. So what it does, swirl and colours affect viewers based on their will save. If the creature critically succeeds, it's unaffected. On a normal success, it is dazzled for one round. On a failure, the creature is stunned one, blinding one, and dazzled for one minute, so the stunned and blinding are one round. And on a critical fail, the creature is stunned for one round and blinded for one minute. So ranking these, both systems have access to this at level 1, meaning this is a drawer. For the access, sorcerers and wizards have access to this in D&D, whereas arcane and occult practitioners have access to this in Pathfinder, meaning this is a win for Pathfinder. The range and target both start at yourself with a 15 foot cone, so this will be a drawer. The casting time, it is one action versus two actions, this is also a drawer. The casting components, for D&D it requires vocal, somatic and material, whereas Pathfinder it is simply vocal and somatic, meaning this is a win for Pathfinder. The effect, it is 6d10 hit points worth of creatures are blinded, starting with the lowest hit point for D&D, whereas Pathfinder it depends on the save, however it targets all creatures, and even on a success they are dazzled, so I'm going to call this a win for Pathfinder. Duration, it is simply one round for D&D, whereas Pathfinder, it is dazzled for one round, but the more they fail their saving throws, the longer it can go all the way up to a full minute. I'm going to call this one a win for Pathfinder. The heightened version, it is an additional 2d10 hit points worth of creatures per spell for D&D, 
whereas Pathfinder it doesn't have a heightened version. I'm going to give this a win for D&D simply because Pathfinder doesn't have a heightened version, but in reality Pathfinder doesn't need a heightened version because it affects all creatures anyway. However, still based on the core rules this is a win for D&D. And the save, D&D has no save whereas Pathfinder they can save and completely ignore the effects, so I'm going to call this a win for D&D. So with a score of 5 in D&D's favour to 7 in Pathfinder's favour, I'm going to call this a win for Pathfinder. Now we can move on to Command. So for D&D, Command is a first level spell available to the Cleric and the Paladin. Knowledge Domain and Order Domain Clerics also get this one for free without having to spend a spell slot, and Oath of the Crown and Oath of Conquest Paladins also get this for free without sacrificing a spell slot, as well as the Fiend Warlock also has access to this. Its cast in time is one action and it requires vocal components only. The range is 60 feet, the duration is one round, and it is a wisdom saving throw. You speak a one word command to a creature you can see within range. The target must succeed on a wisdom save and throw or follow the commands on its next turn. The spell has no effect if the target is undead, if the target doesn't understand your language or if your command is directly harmful to it. Some typical commands and their effects follow. You may issue a command other than the one described here. If you do so the GM determines how the target behaves. If the target can't follow your command the spell will end. Approach. The target moves towards you by the shortest and most direct route, ending its turn if it moves within 5 feet of you. Drop. The target drops whatever it is holding and then ends its turn. Flee. The target spends its turn moving away from you by the fastest available means. Grovel. The target falls prone and ends its turn. Halt. The target doesn't move or takes no actions. A flying creature stays aloft provided it is able to do so. If it must move to stay aloft it flies the minimum distance needed to remain in the air. At high levels when you cast the spell using a spell slot of second level or higher you can affect one additional creature for each slot above first. The creatures must be within 30 feet of each other when you target them. And for Pathfinder, Command is also a first level spell. Its traditions are Arcane, Divine and Occultic, as well as the Fever Witch have an access to this. Its casting time is 2 actions and it requires somatic and verbal components. The range is 30 feet and it targets 1 creature. The saving throw is Will and the duration is until the end of the target's next turn. You shout a command that's hard to ignore. You can command a creature to approach you, run away as if it had the fleeing condition, release what it's holding, drop prone or stand in place. It can't delay or take any reactions until it has obeyed your command. The effect depends on the target's will save. If it succeeds the creature is unaffected. If it fails for the first action on its next turn the creature must use a single action to do as you command. If it critically fails the creature must use all its actions on its next turn obeying your commands. And if you cast the spell at level 5 or higher it will target up to 10 additional creatures. So when we have a look at this spell both spells are available at level 1 in both systems this is going to be a drawer. For the access in D&D clerics, paladins and the fiend warlock have access to this whereas in Pathfinder arcane, divine and occult practitioners all have access to this. This will be a win for Pathfinder. The range in target for D&D it is 60 feet and it targets one creature whereas Pathfinder it is 30 feet targeting one creature. This will be a win for D&D. For the casting time it requires one action in D&D, two actions for Pathfinder this will be a drawer. The component it only requires a vocal component in D&D whereas it's vocal and somatic in Pathfinder so this is a win for D&D. The effect it commands a creature both have pretty much the same general effects so this will be a drawer. For the duration D&D has a guaranteed one round taking up the opponent's entire next turn whereas for Pathfinder if they succeed they ignore it same as D&D however if they fail their willpower they take one of their two actions. It's not unless they critically fail do they take all three of their actions so I'm actually going to give this a win for D&D. It's guaranteed for one round whereas Pathfinder is not. 
so win for D&D. For the heightened version, D&D it is one creature per spell slot, whereas Pathfinder when you target it at as a 5th level spell or higher, it will automatically target 10 creatures. Both of them can go right up. D&D technically targets 9 creatures, Pathfinder 10, but Pathfinder has 10th level spells. I'm going to give this a win to Pathfinder, it can target more creatures at a lower level and more creatures all up, so win for Pathfinder. And both of them have a wisdom saving throw, so this is going to be a draw for both. And for 7 wins for D&D versus the 6 wins for Pathfinder, this is a win for D&D. Command is a little more versatile and it is guaranteed to take the opponent's next turn, whereas Pathfinder, not quite as versatile, it doesn't say in the core rules, so raw as red, you can only do a few separate commands, whereas D&D, it has the same commands, but you can expand on that by talking to the DM. I would let my Pathfinder characters create other commands, but we're judging this not via homebrew rules, we're judging this via rules as written. So duration is better, effect is kind of a bit better, yep this is a win for D&D. And now we have a look at the spell Comprehend Language. So for D&D this is a first level spell available to bards, sorcerers, warlocks and wizards. It has a casting time of one action, however it is also a ritual spell opening it up for being able to be cast without using a spell slot. The target is self, the components are vocal, somatic and material. Its duration is one hour, and for the duration you understand the literal meaning of any spoken language you hear. You also understand the written language that you see, but you must be touching the surface on which the words are written. It takes about one minute to read one page of text, so you get about 60 minutes, 60 pages all up. The spell doesn't decode secret messages in a text or glyphs, such as an arcane sigil, or one that isn't part of a written language. For Pathfinder, Comprehend Languages is a second level spell available to the Arcane, Divine and Occult Practitioners with four different deities given their clerics free access to it. Its cast and time are two actions and it requires somatic and verbal components. The range is 30 feet and it can target one creature. The good thing about this is it's any creature. You can be the creature or you can give it to somebody else if you want. The duration is one hour. The target can understand the meaning of a single language it is hearing or reading when you cast the spell. It doesn't let it understand codes, languages couched in metaphor, and the like, subject to the GM's discretion. So you wouldn't understand Shaka when the walls fell unless you actually spent time with someone understanding what that metaphor meant. If the target can hear multiple languages and knows that, it can choose which language to understand. Otherwise, choose one of the languages randomly. And when you cast this spell at level 3, the target can also speak the language. And at level 4, you can target up to 10 creatures and the targets can all also speak the language. So ranking this, D&D has the spell available at level 1, whereas Pathfinder has it at level 2. So this is a win for D&D. For the access, bards, sorcerers, warlocks and wizards all have access to this for D&D, whereas it is arcane, divine and occult practitioners in Pathfinder, I'm calling this a win for Pathfinder. For the range and target, you can only cast this on yourself in D&D, whereas the range and target is one creature for Pathfinder, this will be a win for Pathfinder. The casting time, it is one action versus two actions, so this is technically a draw, however D&D has this available as a ritual, so I'm going to give the win to D&D. Casting components, vocal material and somatic for D&D, vocal and somatic for Pathfinder, win for Pathfinder. The effect, both you can understand and read a language, so this will be a draw. Both have a duration of one hour, so this is also a draw. The heightened effect, for D&D there is no heightened effect, whereas Pathfinder, if you cast this at a third level spell slot, you can also speak the language, and at fourth level you can target up to 10 creatures, so I'm calling this a win for Pathfinder. And neither have a save, so this will be a draw. So with a score of 5 to 7 in Pathfinder's favour, this is a win for Pathfinder. And our final spell today is Cone of Cold. 
For D&D, this is a 5th level spell available to sorcerers and wizards. With the circle of the land Arctic Druid having access to this, the Hexblade, Genie and Fathomous Warlocks having access to this, and the Artillerists also having access to this. Its casting time is one action, requiring vocal, somatic and material components. The range is yourself with a 60 foot cone, the duration is instantaneous and it has a con save attached to it. A blast of cold air erupts from your hands. Each creature in a 60 foot cone must make a constitution save and throw. A creature takes 8d8 cold damage on a failed save and throw and half as much on a successful one. A creature killed by the spell becomes a frozen statue until it is thawed. And at higher levels, you can cast the spell with a spell slot of 6th level or higher. The damage is increased by 1d8 for each level. For Pathfinder, Cone of Cold is also a 5th level spell, with the traditions of Arcane and Primal, with three different deities also given access to the spell. Its casting time is two actions requiring somatic and verbal components, and its area is a 60 foot cone starting from yourself. The saving throw is a basic reflex. Icy cold rushes forth from your hands and deals 12d6 cold damage to creatures in the area, and the heightened effect it increases the damage by 2d6 per spell level. So we can see when we grade this, both systems have access to this at level 5, meaning this is a drawer. For the access, sorcerers and wizards have access to this, with a few different subclasses also having access to this. For Pathfinder, it is arcane and primal, so I'm going to give this a win to Pathfinder. For the range and target, both start at yourself with a 60 foot cone, so I'm going to call this a drawer. Casting time is 1 action versus 2 actions, this is also a drawer. Casting component is vocal, somatic and material for D&D, vocal and somatic for Pathfinder, this is a win for Pathfinder. The damage, it is 8d8 cold damage for D&D, this gives you a range of 8 to 64 with 36 being the average, whereas Pathfinder it is 12d6 cold damage, this gives you a range of 12 to 72 with 42 being the average, so I'm going to call this a win for Pathfinder. Both have no duration, so this will be a draw for both. And the heightened version, it is 1d8 per spell level, up to a maximum of 12d8 for D&D. This gives you a range of 12 to 96, with 54 being the average. Whereas Pathfinder, it is 2d6 per spell level. This gives you a maximum of 22d6 at level 10. So we have a range of 22 to 132, with 77 being the average for Pathfinder, this giving it a win for Pathfinder. And for the save, it is a constitution save for D&D, so that there is how well you can withstand the cold, whereas it is a basic reflex for Pathfinder, how quickly you can dodge it. I'm going to call this a draw for the both of them. So as we can see, D&D, we have four wins for D&D. Well, we actually have three wins and one draw, whereas Pathfinder, we have the one draw and we have six wins for Pathfinder. D&D wins the chill touch on a bonus, but that still counts as a win in my books. So yeah, to begin with, we thought that utility spells were better in D&D, whereas damage spells were better in Pathfinder. This is the second time where we have actually seen a damage dealing spell in D&D being better. Obviously Conan, Cold and Chain Lightning are better in Pathfinder, but Chill Touch, it's just better because of the range and because it can damage both living and undead. Whereas utility spells, yeah, Command and Clairvoyance still seem to be better in D&D. Comprehend Languages is a little bit better in Pathfinder simply because you don't target just yourself. And Color Spray is much better because it hits everyone, whereas in D&D it only hits a certain hit dice version or amount of people. So thank you very much for joining me as we look through these ones. We will be doing nine more in the next video. Don't forget, if you leave a comment, I will generally respond to that comment and I'll put your comment onto the channel and discuss it as part of the opening segment. So thank you very much, Kakitiano, and we will catch you guys later.